so yeah, we're going to continue on the user acquisition track. Um, I'm not Argentinian, I have to say. Um, I'm not Italian either. I am German, but I do have an, an Australian passport, if that helps you guys. Um, so basically, we're talking specifically about how you can actually use Facebook for mobile acquisition. Um, first of all, let me just give you a very brief background on who we are and what we do, um, because in Germany here we are still pretty new. So we're an American company called AdKnowledge, um, and I'll explain the ad part a bit in a moment. So AdKnowledge is based out of Kansas City. It was originally founded um, back in 2004 and was focusing a lot on email marketing. Um, but then started to acquire a number of businesses. So, for instance, at Parler, which was acquired back in 2011, um, and is our social media, social advertising arm, if you like. So, what we do in a nutshell is we dock onto the APIs of Facebook and Twitter and are able then to, um, by using our own technology, to optimize towards things like cost per install, for instance. Um, so that's our main um, focus. Um, whilst we are in North America, we also have offices in um, the UK, in Germany and France. I head up the um, German offices and we are um, based in, in Munich. I've only just started this year, so in February 2013. Um, you can see some of our clients down there, but we do a lot in the gaming space. Obviously, brands, we work with a lot of direct um, response advertisers and agencies. Okay, so let's go straight into the presentation because that's the more interesting bit. Um, first of all, you all know this and, and you've heard it today, there's an awful lot of um, apps that were downloaded in 2012, so uh, somewhere between 56 and 82 billion. Uh, on Google Play, I mean, again, you hear different numbers and iOS, App Store, um, you, you find something like one million apps or even more. So for app developers, it's extremely difficult to really um, you know, do app discovery properly. And also loyalty has become a big issue because some people might download your app, but if they're not using it, what's the point of this? So we're not saying Facebook is the only option you've got, but it's certainly a very interesting one because it's new. They've only just last year started to get into mobile, um, seriously. Um, so within 12 months, you can see figures like that. So 145 million app installs on Facebook and 8,200 advertisers. A lot of people and app developers don't use it yet, but they're getting more and more into it because they see the positive results. Um, these are some figures on um, the success of Facebook in Germany specifically. Um, that's uh, mobile as well as desktop. But you can see in total they've got already 25 million users. That's about 43% of the internet population. And 18 million of those would access Facebook through, um, through mobile. And they have also very high engagement rates. So one of the things since I've started working with Facebook much closer I've been pondering about was how were they able to be so successful in their space? I mean, if you look at it, they've got 1.2 billion users globally now. On top of that, they've got engagement rates that a lot of publishers would only dream of. So what I would like to do is, wearing my psychologist hat, is share some insights with you as to why that's been happening, because I think it's interesting for you to understand. Um, so first of all, let me ask the audience, uh, what do you think chocolate and Facebook have in common? Any, any votes? Yes, that's exactly it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, exactly, it's about addiction. Um, so dopamine is the uh, neurotransmitter in the human brain that stands behind all of this. And that's very interesting because dopamine is the, the hormone that also gets released when you get excited about some news. So let's say you get a salary increase or you're falling in love, for instance. That's when dopamine happens. So when you're seeing these people um, you know, running around with ice creams very happily, they're going from one roller coaster to another, usually there's dopamine at, at play. That's what happens. Um, I guess the good news for you, if you are at that time pretty miserable and sad and don't want to see all these happy people, it's not going to last, I can tell you also, because dopamine is a neurotransmitter that doesn't last for very long, as you can see from many relationships, um, because ultimately these this dopamine-based relationships don't usually last for very long. So how, what does that have to do with Facebook? Um, so essentially, when you go to Facebook, or let's say you are on a holiday somewhere, say in Thailand, um, standing at some beautiful beach, and um, you see the sunset, so you take a picture, what do you do first? You post it on Facebook. So then you leave Facebook, you go somewhere else, five minutes later, what do you think you're doing straight after this? Exactly, you check your Facebook, you go straight back in because you want to know how many likes you got. Because that's exactly what triggers dopamine. So because it's a happiness hormone, right? So whenever um, you see a new like, and maybe it's 10, 20, 30 likes, all of a sudden you're much happier. Um, because especially when you're sad and maybe not in such a good mood, then you know, that helps you even further. So certainly um, 
what Facebook has done in an in incredibly smart way is they've built in a lot of functionality that would release dopamine. Now, think about somebody sharing that photo. So that's even further than that, because not only did people like it, but they actually shared it with their friends, which is much, much, much of a bigger thing, right? Um, so you get even happier. Um, same thing with um, checking in at certain locations. So say you go to Bangkok Airport and you're checking in. Again, a lot of people will like that because they think maybe you're a cool dude, you're a trendsetter, you're, um, you're flying around, etc., etc. So it says something about your image and, and how you are perceived in the community. So um, the other thing that's quite interesting, there's some stats that seven out of 10 people check Facebook before going to sleep. Um, I'm one of them, I have to say. So, and I think a lot of people in the room can relate to this. Uh, it is addictive. Um, but it's not just really um, Facebook, but it's also Twitter. Not as addictive as Facebook, but 20% say they don't go to sleep and they have, they've checked their favorite celebs tweets. Now this is um, pretty gross, but uh, a lot of people seem to do that too. Um, so I could ask you to put up your hands, um, whether you fall into the group, but I'm not going to do this. Um, I mean, seriously, again, talking as a psychology, you should get some therapy if you're doing this, but anyway. Um, so, what does that mean for advertisers? So first of all, of course, if you think about the frame of mind that people are in, um, you can think about the kind of ads you would post. Now, it's quite interesting. With Facebook, um, I remember when I was still in Australia, a lot of people were telling me, oh, this Facebook thing is never going to take off. You know, they're never going to make any money. It's always the same discussion you have with people, with any channel that happens. That was happening with mobile and all sorts of other stuff as well. And now look at these figures. Within a year, they've turned it around from now, you know, almost 16% of the mobile online advertising revenue globally is already um, coming through Facebook. So that's telling you a story, which means that it obviously is working for some people. As Mary Meeker stated in her um, annual Internet Trends report, mobile is helping to drive users and, and revenue for Facebook um, quite strongly. Now, almost 50% of the advertising revenue um, of Facebook is going through mobile. So again, that's telling a story that they obviously seem to be doing something right. Okay, so as an advertiser, how can you do it on Facebook? Um, now, first of all, it's important to understand the power of the newsfeed. Um, so remember maybe on the desktop before there was, um, oh, it's still there, but they're not as prominent anymore. And um, the domain ads on the right hand side, they didn't really work all that well. So Facebook has changed this. They're still using it. However, um, what they've shifted to is the um, news feed, which you see as you're scrolling through your friends' news, there's usually like some, some advertising in there. It can be pretty annoying for some people, but it also works because it blends in quite well with the rest of the organic content. And you see all the figures there, 40% of time spent is in newsfeed, over 180 billion um, impressions, etc., etc., and much better engagement rates. Um, also, what they've done well is they've built some great um, native ad units. So photo page post ads, for instance. Um, if you compare that to a standard banner ad, which you see on the left-hand side, I think the, the standard banner ad takes something like 7% of the green, uh, screen. Um, the newsfeed ad takes about 92%. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised that it's only 38% more attention, but anyway, that's what it is. Um, also on the right hand side, you see the mobile app install ads, and they're very relevant for you guys because this is essentially, as a, I think we're doing now something like between two and four million app installs um, every month, and these are the kind of ad units we would be using. So essentially, you s again, you see it in your newsfeed, maybe on your app, you click on it, and then it sees which, what kind of device you've got, whether it's um, an iOS device or whether it's, for instance, a Samsung, and then it redirects you straight into the uh, mobile app store, and then what we do is we basically charge not just when a user downloads it, but when they go back into the app for the first time. Um, so, the other, so one thing is to keep in mind the ad formats and the creative. The other thing that's really important and great about Facebook is the data. And you all have heard about the social graph. It's incredible how much information they've got available. So there's demographic, which a lot of other people have as well. But on top of that, you get a lot of data on the mobile consumer. So, you know, what kind of devices they're using? Are they still using a feature phone? Um, are they smartphone users? Uh, what kind of device model are they actually using? You get a lot of interest targeting as well. Um, so stuff like, you know, um, what, what kind of um, things they like. So if you have a football app, for instance, then, you know, you could target people who like Ozil or Schweinsteiger or whatever else. So all this sort of information is available and, and you can go after it. And then the last bit is custom audience targeting. Just so I understand, who of you has heard and, and knows what custom audience targeting is? 
Okay, a few, but not too many. Um, let me just r quickly run through that because it's a really interesting concept. Again, Facebook have been quite good at, uh, at adjusting or, or implementing new technologies. And one of them is this um, interesting thing called custom audience targeting. The way it works is, let's say you've got an um, existing database of app users. And let's say you've got either the email address, maybe a phone number, maybe a Facebook user ID, or even an app ID if you've registered with Facebook SDK. Then what you could do is um, you could essentially upload those users um, into the Power Editor, and you can do a match with the Facebook audience. Now, why would you do that? Well, there's three use cases. So that's what's called inclusion targeting, exclusion targeting, and lookalike targeting. With inclusion targeting, what you do is you essentially include your existing audience and you show them an ad. Why would you do that? Well, for instance, if you wanted to reactivate users who are not using the app anymore, you could show them an ad and ask them to come back. Or you could say, well, actually, I want to convert my existing users into fans on Facebook. Or you might do something like a member get member campaign or friendship campaign where you encourage existing users to share it with um, their own friends. So that's, that's one or three use cases for inclusion targeting. The second one is exclusion targeting. So you deliberately don't include your existing audience into this campaign. Why would you do that? Well, because they're already users. Um, since it's a prospecting campaign, you might want to exclude them because that means it's, it's going to lower your CPI. And then the third one is what's called lookalike audience. Um, that's the most recent um, addition in the Facebook technology. And what they've done here um, is also very, very smart. It's, it's, what it does, it um, finds what we call statistical twins within Facebook. So it looks at the profile of your existing app users and looks for people who j look just like them. And you can imagine that that's pretty powerful because of all the social graph data, data that's available, um, you know, you can get a pretty good understanding of what kind of profile your users look at. By the way, you don't actually see the profile, so it's more like a black box. Um, all they do is they spit out an audience um, and then basically show them an ad. That's how it usually works. Okay, um, that was lookalike audience. We've already talked about that. Um, just a few more um, slides. So this is a um, something we're doing with Pixel Max, which is essentially the Spotify for magazines. So you pay something like four ninety nine pounds, I think, um, and then you get unlimited access to a whole range of different magazines. Um, so we used uh, keyword targeting there. Again, a lot of data and information available. Uh, in this case, we targeted specific keywords such as gossip, uh, magazine, hello magazine, etc., which was really powerful. Um, and you see the results there. Uh, Ebookers, uh, obviously big travel um, client, they also have an app. Um, recently, Facebook introduced CPA bidding as of the 21st of October. So what we did essentially um, ran a, an app install campaign for Ebookers. And because we used CPA, that helped us a lot on top of the other stuff we did. Um, and you can see some of the results, which were really, um, really good as well. Um, the other thing is we've, we've developed a database now um, across all our campaigns globally to understand what kind of criteria do work well for specific campaigns, for specific verticals, for instance. And so we are able now to aggregate all this information and find some criteria that, that matter. Um, and so here um, we found out that, interestingly enough, across all our campaigns, uh, CPI campaigns, across per install campaigns, that is, Thursdays and Sundays seem to be working best. I have no idea why that is, but it just seems to be the case. So there you go. Um, Android ver versus iOS, we've got actually... So, so what's important to understand is um, for iOS, uh, there's more competition on Facebook. So typically you pay a higher CPC. Um, so what we find is that the CPI still backs out better for, uh, for Android campaigns. Um, because the competition is lower, but the conversion rates are actually not as high as on, on iOS campaigns. Um, measurement, I mean, we've heard some stuff before. I don't have to uh, add an awful lot to it, but basically it can be good to have the Facebook SDK installed. You don't necessarily have to do it. We can also work with a lot of the third-party guys, um, like, you know, has of us, ad even, etc. All of them have been mentioned. Um, what's important is if you want to go beyond install, um, then obviously those third-party tracking um, tools are very important because what they can do is they can deliver back the information to us, whether these guys had any in-app events uh, happening or whether they were monetizing as users. Um, and then we can optimize towards these goals. 
So um, I'm almost at the end. So some of the stuff that's to come. Um, this is pretty new still. So Facebook have some plans for uh, um, partnerships with PayPal and Braintree, and that's for in-app purchases. Um, what they want to do here is use credit card information that's already stored in the Facebook account. Um, this can be quite powerful. There is a limitation because you have to have your information in the actual um, Facebook uh, account already stored, so that makes it a bit harder. But um, for users, it would be obviously much easier to, um, to, to do an in-app purchase because I don't ha have to type in all this stuff. Um, plus, Facebook will also know a lot about e-commerce companies uh, and what kind of stuff people are buying, um, how much they're buying, etc. So a lot of data going their we way, which then in um, return they can use again for optimization of campaigns. And that's it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.